coincide with the COP26 conference being held in Glasgow, the Pat O'Donnell Socialist Republican Forum has convened a conversation between two eminent environmentalists, one from the United States of America, the other from Ireland. The American speaker is Sean McBrearty from the Oil and Water Don't Mix campaign, which is struggling to prevent a large multinational driving an oil pipeline through the Great Lakes and risking the pollution of the natural water in the area. From Ireland, we have Fidelma O'Kean, part of the Save Our Sperrins. Fidelma is campaigning to prevent a large multinational mining for gold in the Spern Mountains and therefore damaging beyond repair the environment not only of the immediate area but of large parts of Ireland. Conducting the interview is Patricia Campbell of the Pater Donald Socialist Republican Forum. So sit back and listen and be informed, be educated about what's facing us if we don't resist this threat to our world. The Petter O'Donnell Socialist Republican Forum are delighted to host this interview with two environmental campaigners, one from the US and one from County Tyrone in Ireland. They are leading campaigners against mining companies attempting to profit from our our natural resources and we believe destroying the environment in the process at a time of environmental crisis. We have Sean McBrady from Michigan in the US. He is coordinator of the Oil and Water Don't Mix Coalition, OWDM, which is campaigning to shut down oil pipelines that endanger the great lakes of Michigan. Now, OWDM had a huge win last year. They they revoked the Enbridge or Enbridge Line 5 oil pipeline easement. Enbridge is a multinational company. It focuses on the transportation of crude oil and natural gas, primarily in North America. Fidelma O'Kane is a retired lecturer and former social worker. She certainly hasn't retired from campaigning. She is secretary of Save Our Spurrens Group, which is campaigning against the planning application of a Canadian gold mining company, Dalradian, for a gold mining processing plant in the Spurren Mountains in County Tyrone, in Ireland. Now we'll start off with you first, Sean, and would you mind giving us a background to to the campaign in Michigan? Absolutely, and uh, thank you very much for having me, uh, Patricia. It's great to be here today with you and Fidelma. Um, So the uh, Enbridge Line 5 oil pipeline Um, is a 68-year-old oil pipeline that essentially transports uh, Canadian oil from Canada back to Canada using uh, the Great Lakes and the state of Michigan as a shortcut. Um, It's a 640-mile-long pipeline that goes uh, from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan across um, a body, a very delicate body of water we call the Straits of Mackinac, um, and then across the southern peninsula or the lower peninsula of Michigan and back into Canada. Uh, now, the part of the pipeline we're most concerned about is the Straits of Mackinac, um, because the Straits is a f- about roughly five mile wide body of water, which separates Lake Michigan from Lake Huron. Um, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are actually technically one body of water, and yeah. they slosh back and forth at the Straits. Um, So the currents in the Straits change direction every one to three days. Um, They change direction 180 degrees. Um, And 
the best studies that we've had, if, if there's a pipeline spill here um, in a pipeline that runs 540,000 barrels of oil every day, um, we would have over 740 miles of Great Lakes shoreline at risk, uh, as well as uh, the waters of the Great Lakes, which uh, the Great Lakes taken all together constitute um, over 95% of the North American freshwater supply uh, and a little over 20% of the global freshwater supply. Um, so right now, we're at a point where after eight years of campaigning, uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan has revoked Enbridge Energy's easement to operate the Line 5 pipeline in the Straits of Mackinac. Um, despite that, Enbridge is continuing to operate the pipeline illegally in Michigan right now um, while the court process plays out. And last week, the Canadian federal government um, actually intervened um, in the court case uh, going on around Line 5, and they also uh, invoked a 1977 pipeline treaty uh, with the United States that we don't believe and our lawyers don't believe applies in this case. Uh, but the Canadian federal government is essentially just trying to buy time uh, for Enbridge to continue operating illegally uh, here through Michigan while the Great Lakes remain at risk from a major oil spill. Right. So it sounds really interesting, Sean, and <clears throat> we'll speak more about, um, you know, the type of things that you're doing to highlight this. Um, we have a similar issue here in Ireland and Fidelma took a successful judicial review against the Northern Ireland Environment Agency for granting a uh, Dalradian uh, a, a discharge consent to discharge effluents containing heavy metals, including mercury and arsenic, into the Owen Kilu River, which is a special area of uh, conservation. It, it, it defies belief that they could call themselves an environmental agency when they would uh, allow this. So, Fidelma, could you give us a background of of what's happening in the Spurin Mountains in County Tyrone. Um, thanks, Patricia, and thank you for inviting us to, to participate in this. Um, well, Dalradian is a Canadian exploration company, and they came here actually 10 years ago, but we weren't aware of them uh, for three or four or five years and uh, that they were here because they were working away under the radar and getting uh, identifying people of influence, getting to know government departments and doing all their groundwork. They got the um, prospecting licenses over a huge area, 122,000 hectares in counties Tyrone and County Derry. And they um, applied to the Crown Estate. The Queen of England actually uh, owns the precious metals under the ground and so she gets um, a four percent tax on all mine gold and silver. So um, the, that the Crown Estate granted these option agreements with Dalradian over the same one hundred and twenty-two thousand hectares. Now we became aware of them probably about twenty fourteen, and in twenty fifteen we set up Save Our Spurns to campaign against Dalradian and. Um, First of all, we had to do a lot of sports groundwork, you know, learning about gold mining and and the whole story. Like because we couldn't believe that the government departments would allow a project that could damage our water, our air, our land, and ultimately our health. And the more we uh, linked with studies throughout the world and campaign groups in other countries, and we learned. You know that gold mining, there's ex use of explosives to blow out the rock. There's a huge amount of rock taken out in order to get at the veins or the, the specks of gold. And then that has to be soaked in a solution, usually of cyanide, to float the, the gold ore out of the rock. Um, that then uh, strips out other heavy metals like arsenic and mercury and lead and cadmium and chromium, etc. And Dalradian said that when they would take the rock out, they would be crushing it to the fine consistency of sand. And then, so they, they then do the flotation 
uh, take out the gold ore and put the rest of the waste rock into a huge dump. And they talked in their planning application about a waste rock facility that would be 54 metres high. That would be 17 storeys. And it would be, um, I think, 895 metres long and 365 metres wide. And this, the plan to site this on top of a mountain, a small mountain here, Crockenboy Hill. And it's only 1,200 metres from the local primary school. And that really shocked us. And it's only about 500 metres from the community centre and the chapel and the playing football club, playing fields, etc. And to have such a, a toxic industry so close to habitation uh, was really shocking. And it seems like the, the Dalradian got in with the government departments, and I know you mentioned there about Northern Ireland and Environment Agency, but they really have uh, very strange powers because they actually are a consultative body for the mining industry and for all industries coming in here. They also are the um, regulatory body, they're the advisory body, and then they're the enforcement body. So it's contradictory and we feel there's a conflict of interest. Dalradian actually, they've, uh, this past four years, they have advertisements in the local paper every week and they claim to have had, I think it was over 200 meetings with government departments in order to progress their planning application. They submitted Indeed. the planning application. Sorry, am I going on too long there, Patricia? No, tell me about how they, when they submitted the planning application. They submitted it in November 2017, and it was 10,000 pages. And um, then in, in November, they still haven't got planning permission, I may add. But um, in 2019, they submitted a first addendum because uh, there were, at that stage, uh, say 20,000 objections already lodged with the planning department. So they then said that they wouldn't use cyanide on the site here, that they would transport the ore abroad to use cyanide abroad. Now, they didn't say what country they were going to. They just said abroad. But I suppose there were two uh, things came to our mind. We thought, did they really mean that? Because their feasibility study said it wouldn't be financially viable if they weren't able to use a, a strong concentration of cyanide on site. And two, we thought, uh, we and we thought perhaps they're just saying this until they get planning permission, and then they'll bring the the cyanidation process back into the equation. And we also have had strong feelings about why should we export that to another country that might not have the regulations or to oppose it, or the people may not have the ability to you know to uh, to oppose it. So. Yeah. Uh, we, that's that's that situation. And then in December 2020, they submitted a second addendum. I think there's about 20,000 pages in it. And they, there wasn't that much really difference. They got more consultants on board. And basically, all the things we were putting in, the objections, how it would affect the water, how it would affect the air, how it would affect the land and how it would affect people's health. I mean, um, the consultants were saying there would be no significant impact. No, just a little bit of poison, but no significant impact. So um, it's now very recently the Department for Infrastructure, who has the final say, the minister there, has announced there will be a public inquiry. She didn't give any dates, but we imagine it will be next year. The public inquiry will mean that everybody comes and gives their views. Dalradian will be able to bring in a whole troop of consultants and experts to dance to their tune. We, the people, will have to speak for ourselves and we hope to do some fundraising so that we can bring in some consultants as well. And oh, then yeah. the planning, the Pub, the Planning Appeals Commission will make a recommendation to the Minister and the Minister has the final say. They can accept it or overturn it. So that's that's what's ahead of us. Okay, thank you for that, Fidelma. Well, Dalradian is, uh, is a subsidiary. It's, it's owned by a Canadian parent company, which is fully financed by a New York hedge fund. So I think it's important to let our listeners know what we're dealing with. Sean, could you explain 
how the hedge fund works. Um, yeah, I can, I can explain sort of the edges of how the hedge fund works. Um, so, and this is a fairly common setup for um, extraction industries, whether it's mining or whether it's oil and gas uh, transport or uh, drilling industries, where they have a setup where there is sort of a um, corporate, uh, it, you know, there's one corporation and then several different subsidiaries. So in the examples we can look at here, um, Enbridge is fully, is, uh, the parent company is Enbridge Inc. And well, Enbridge Inc. has over 200 different subsidiaries. And the reason they structure things that way um, is, let's say there's a subsidiary, uh, there's two subsidiaries, for example, that own Line 5. Um, if uh, Line 5 were to spill into the Great Lakes, um, those subsidiaries would be liable parties, but Enbridge Inc. would not be financially liable. So what they could do is bankrupt those two, um, uh, those two subsidiaries, and Ed Enbridge Inc. gets away scot-free. And there's a similar setup here with Dalradian, well, Del, where Dalradian Gold in Ireland is a subsidiary of Dalradian Inc. in Canada, uh, which, as you said, was fully owned by Orion Resource Partners, um, a hedge fund in New York City that owns um, tons of other mining operations across the world. Um, and one of the other big problems with uh, specifically hedge funds and that sort of financing uh, setup is um, they are they're they're kind of black boxes. They're incredibly difficult uh, to get into and really see what the financial inner workings um, of a hedge fund are, since it's not publicly traded. Um, so, for instance, they have to give much fewer reports, being an American hedge fund, to uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission than if they were a publicly traded company. Um, and so that, you know, again, it heightens the risk uh, because let's say something bad were to happen with Dalready and Gold, um, there's a chance that with the corporate setup they've uh, put up here, um, they'd be able to have Dalready and Gold go bankrupt uh, or go out of business in some other way and not have any other party in that chain liable uh, to pay for the mess that they make in the process, um, leaving uh, you know, the people of uh, Tyrone and the people of Ireland to pay for the cleanup, just like Enbridge would be looking to leave Michigan to pay uh, for the cleanup of the Line 5 oil spill in the Straits of Mackinac. Wow. So it, it, it's really important that people are aware of that because they're saying that this is going to bring jobs to the area and they're making it out that it's going to be rosy in the garden sort of thing, jobs for the for people. You know, how do you, no doubt that they have the same course in America, promising jobs and prosperity? Absolutely. They, um, you know, they've promised, uh, they've promised jobs building Enbridge's plan right now um, they employ fewer than 300 people uh, in Michigan, um, which is a state with a population of over 10 million. Um, and they claim right now what Enbridge is trying to do, they're trying to pull a fast one on the state and federal governments here. They're claiming that they want to replace the existing Line 5 pipeline, which sits at the bottom of the Straits of Mackinac, with an oil tunnel uh, dug underneath the Great Lakes, <laughs> um, which is... You know, just as ridiculous as it sounds uh, when the world's leading climate scientists are telling us we have ten year, less than 10 years um, to decarbonize our economy if we want to have a livable world for future generations. Um, and so what they're doing with this tunnel scheme is they're working to get, uh, you know, different groups on board by promising a lot of jobs. Um, but then even their best estimates are that the jobs would be around, you know, during construction for a period of uh, somewhere between four and seven years. Um, and after that, the jobs would go away. And we, yeah. and we just saw an example of this play out um, in one of our neighboring uh, states, well, actually two states over in Minnesota. Enbridge just finished building um, their Line 3 replacement project. And they promised people in Minnesota that they would bring in all of these local jobs. Well, the local jobs never materialized. They brought in specialized workers, uh, from out of state um, and from out of the country 
who were really taking the high paying jobs on these projects. Um, and, you know, after six, eight months of construction, those jobs are now gone. Um, so the job promise, I think, is common across this industry. And it's one of the more insidious things that they do um, to promise local jobs that never materialize uh, and then leave a, leave a community to clean up the mess that they make afterwards. Absolutely. Um, well, just, I mean, they're very highly resourced mining companies and they're backed by the state. And that's very apparent um, in the US and here in Ireland. And I, I note we're in Minnesota, law enforcement shared intelligence on protest organisers with the pipeline company. Um, Enbridge had close relations relationships with police. So, and it's the same here in County Tyrone in Ireland. And Fidelma, maybe you could um, tell us about what's happening there in uh, Greencastle and in the Spurin Mountains with regard to um, harassment of protesters. Yes, and I believe this is a common strategy used by mining companies throughout the world, criminalisation of protectors of the land and water. Because uh, we read a booklet by Carlos Zorillo from Ecuador, I think it was published maybe nearly 20 years ago, they had the first edition of it. And we couldn't believe it was the same things that were happening here. And I suppose we, it, it's over the past two years we started to realise it started off with sampler things like, you know, protectors being followed. Both initially, it was mostly women at the beginning, but now men are seeing suspicious cars following them at night. They're cyberbullying. You know, Facebook, we get a lot of abuse on Facebook. Um, then the men were getting sex calls and threatening phone calls. Um, then uh, there was then physical assaults. Um, you know, for example, in a local shop, one of, a supporter of Dalridian uh, punched uh, a protector, I think four or five times, and it was recorded on CCTV. And whenever the man, um, you know, went and reported it, uh, the police said there was no crime. Um, there were there have been murder bids in the form of three different protectors have been knocked down by vehicles driven by Dalradian staff or subcontractors. There have been three death threats delivered by the police to protectors, to their homes, and the police say, couldn't give any information except they believed there were viable or credible uh, death threats. And whenever the protectors report all these incidents to the police, the police ignore, ignore them. Everything is no, no, not an offence, and yet... Um, the police, on the other hand, whenever if we had a protest at Dalrady and Skates, the police respond immediately. It's as if they're on speed day and there are out maybe two or three car loads of them. And there have been harassment of protectors by police. For example, police sitting with the full lights on at a protector's house all night, shining the lights in his window, singling protectors out for special attention at road checks and, the, you know, keeping taking them and holding up the traffic and getting them out of their car and searching the car and you know, delaying them and causing them to feel embarrassment in front of people who are waiting. Um, the, um, the charges that over the past two years have been bringing petty charges against protesters. For example, um, intimidation of Dalradian employees. That was wagging one's finger aggressively at an employee damaging Dalradian property. That was one that was up in court this week. It was a man was charged with cutting two cable ties that uh, at a cost of 12 pence. And it was he was found not guilty. In fact, it seemed as if the cable ties had been cut long before the man was near the premises. Um, blocking a road, um, resisting arrest, aggravated trespass. There's a man currently... He's been up at court every month this last, I would say, six months. For he chained himself to the gates 
of Dalridian's compound because he was protesting that currently Dalridian have no permission to be there. Their prospecting license for the particular area had expired in December 2019. They still have not got planning permission and they should not be working there. And yet he's been charged with aggravated trespass. The police have also been calling at protectors' houses late on a Friday evening, say 10.30pm, and offering them cautions, you know, getting them to ask them to sign that they accept a caution. And then you see, if you accept a caution, then you have a criminal record, like you're admitting then you've done something wrong. So we're telling uh, protectors not to accept the caution, say that they will go to court to fight it. So those are the sort of um, acts that have been going on. But it seems, as I say, throughout the world, we have read in all the, the countries that have mining uh, you know, going on, uh, it seemed to be similar sort of things. And so we're not alone in this. And in fact, I mean, a lot of the third world countries have got worse. They've had rape of women. They've had actual murders of environmental uh, protectors. So, uh, you know, ours... I know it's not to you know, make the reduce them, the, the severity of them, but I'm just saying compared to what other countries, we felt when we were talking to people in Colombia and in Honduras and in Peru, what they have suffered have, has been much worse than what we are suffering. Well, well this is all the more reason to, to campaign vigorously against this mining company. Uh, and no doubt, Sean, um, you have experiences from the US with um, the same type of thing happening to campaigners. Um, yeah, we we have, and uh, the stories that uh, Fidelma shared are just horrific. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, it's a very familiar tune, um, not only in Ireland and the US, but uh, you know, as she said in so many countries across the world uh, where these extraction industries make their home. Um, here um, in Michigan so far, we don't have active construction. We're working to shut down an existing pipeline, and we haven't seen the same level of police violence uh, that our allies have seen in Minnesota, where there was active construction across the summer. And what we saw there was... Uh, that Enbridge, um, you know, the same oil company, was actually funding local sheriff's departments um, in northern Minnesota. They paid over $2 million um, over the course of the summer for these police departments uh, to go in and break up pipeline protests. There were over 500 arrests, um, including 250 in one day over the course of this summer. Um, and this is all in a very sparsely populated uh, you know, sparsely populated communities in northern Minnesota. And yeah. there's another pattern um, at play here. Uh, so both in Michigan and Minnesota and across uh, all of these pipeline fights going on, especially in the Midwest and the United States, um, you know, one of our closest allies and uh, one of our one of the most meaningful parts of our campaign um, is the close relationship uh, that our campaign has developed with uh, the indigenous tribes um, who were you know, the first people of our continent here. Um, and there is a trend uh, that can actually be measured. There are reports about this where indigenous women uh, specifically, uh, their, their rates of going missing or being found murdered increase whenever one of these pipeline building projects comes through. Um, they broke up two different sex trafficking rings among pipeline workers in Minnesota over the course of this summer. Um, but there's a, you know, you can look up the missing and murdered indigenous women campaign in the United States, um, which really tells uh, you know, a very sad story that again carries across uh, many countries in the world uh, where those people who are at the edges of society and who are often in the, in, in, you know, the American society, we've never lived up to the treaties uh, that our federal government signed with the indigenous tribes back in the 1800s. Um, and they are often, unfortunately, treated as second-class citizens here in a lot of ways. And one of them is this 
um, you know, huge amount of uh, indigenous women who uh, go missing um, and are, you know, and are caught up in sex trafficking rings when pipeline workers come through. Um, and so that's something that, you know, we are very conscious of not only the close relationship between the oil companies and um, unfortunately a lot of police departments, uh, but the direct harm that this is causing uh, to already uh, communities that are disadvantaged um, in our country. Yeah, and that, that's very interesting, Sean, and it, it brings to mind James Colney's quote in the Irish Worker in 1915, governments in capitalist society are but committees of the rich to manage the affairs of the capitalist class. Now, you you have managed to get some politicians on side uh, that has, you know, and that has helped your campaign. Um, unfortunately, our politicians would appear have been bought, lock, stock and barrel. Now, we have some um, uh, council representatives and indeed, we had one uh, council representative who was elected on this environmental campaign, on the principles of this campaign, which is very, um, which is really good. But um, I'm just, could you just tell me about what's happening in the US with uh, political support? Yeah, thank you. That's a great, um, great question. And um, so here in uh, here in Michigan, we have uh, some of the worst um, governmental transparency laws in the country. Um, we're consistently ranked near the bottom uh, of governmental transparency. Um, however, uh, you know, so there there is a lot of political of uh, corporate influence on our political system, um, especially after uh, what we call the Citizens United uh, decision before the U.S. Supreme Court um, over a decade ago, where they essentially said that corporate money, or that money equals speech, and corporations are people, uh, and they let corporations spend uh, as much money as they want, essentially, and dark, untraceable money in our political races. Um, oh. Despite that, uh, in 2018, um, the Line 5 pipeline was a major issue in uh, Michigan elections. And we uh, had an election where we were electing a new governor and a new attorney general. And the attorney general in Michigan is the top law enforcement officer, and they're also the top lawyer. Um, so they have a great deal of influence on an issue like this. And one of, um, you know, one of the goals of our campaign over the years was to build up uh, enough public support so that we could make whoever was running for governor and attorney general respond and take a position on line five. And, you know, we found in polling back in 2018 that over 80% of Michigan residents were concerned about the risk of an oil spill in the Great Lakes. Uh, and we were able to um, you know, Michigan voters showed up in large numbers in 2018 and elected Governor Gretchen Whitmer and Attorney General Dana Nessel, both uh, who had pledged to take action on Line 5 and to shut down the pipeline. Um, and, you know, they went through a process, of course, right after they took office in 2019 of studying the issue and listening to the people of Michigan. Uh, and then they took action and they ordered the pipeline shut down. We are currently, you know, still in court uh, over that. Um, however, we're hoping for uh, decisions soon and um, that, uh, you know, that would shut down, shut down line five for good. Um, and, you know, I think it speaks a lot, especially given the lax uh, rules around transparency and money and politics that we have in the United States. Yeah. Uh, it speaks a lot to the character of those two women, uh, Gretchen Whitmer and Dana Nessel, uh, who have stood with us, who are not well-moneyed special interests um, against Enbridge, which is one of the uh, most wealthy oil and gas companies in the world. Absolutely. And hopefully um, we will have people elected who will do the same here. Fidelma, um, how, 
I mean, <laughs> you say that the outset already and have been consulting with government bodies here in the north for quite some time and it, it, it defies belief that that they would allow, especially at this time of environmental crisis. Do you want to say something about that, Fidelma? Yeah, well, surely. Um, a couple of points. I suppose um, the, oh no, what do we see where do I start? Um, uh, yes, they've, they have, we found out they have what they call a major client interface group. That is, Dalradian meets every, I think it's every three months, with all the government departments that are involved in their application. And, and they're treated, Dalradian are treated like, you know, special guests. And we uh, we actually, under Freedom of Information, we asked for, you know, notes of those meetings. And it was really funny. One of the actions out of one of the meetings was to monitor the protesters' Uh, Facebook pages. Can you imagine? They were that busy watching our Facebook pages. This is government departments and Dalridian. Really? And, uh -huh, that was to, to monitor our Facebook pages. So that, that was one thing. Now, you mentioned there about, yeah, at this particular time of climate change, and Dalridian are claiming that they're going to be, that they are carbon neutral and that they will be carbon neutral from, from day one. And yet their plan and application says that on site they will use 3.3 million litres of diesel per year for up to 20 years. That's only on site. That's not talking about the lorries to and from the site or the transportation of the ore to the port or the from the port overseas, wherever that's going. And they also, in their application, they have applied to remove, I think it was 73 or 74 acres of peatland uh, for their, to build their infrastructure. And peatland, as we know, is a very effective carbon store. And they also have applied to abstract half a million gallons of water per day every day of the year for 20 years from the peatland or the bog surrounding their site. That's to provide their water, that they need a huge amount of water for a gold mining. So, uh, so what, what will that do to the peatland and the bog surrounding their site? It will dry it up. It will affect, it will kill all, you know, the, the whole ecosystem. But furthermore, it will actually dry up all the wee aquifers and the streams and will affect the rivers in the areas the area as well, as well as the carbon uh, will be released from that um, you know, bog land. So, and yet they have the audacity to claim that they are carbon neutral or will be carbon neutral. And we have challenged them on this. And they say, initially they said they were going to contribute to a water purification scheme in Cambodia. But as we said, sure, that will do us no good. That might help people in Cambodia, but that's still, they still will be using the 3.3 million litres of diesel here and the fumes will be going into there and poisoning the children at the local school. And uh, then the latest advertisement is they're going to buy cooking pots for women in Malawi. So oh. that, I mean, and I don't, I'm not 100% sure how that's going to make them carbon neutral. They also, uh, one of their advertisements that they give 100 trees to, uh, to each of seven schools. And one of the schools was a local school in Plumbridge. So we contacted the school and the school said no. Dalridian never give them trees and they would not be accepting trees from Dalridian. So we don't, you know, it's so hard to, and no, find out what the truth is. Um, so that that is uh, just a wee bit on the, on their claims. And then recently, it's all greenwashing now. How uh, even though it was a gold mine that they had applied for, now it's uh, they're going to be getting copper and zinc, and that these are needed. Copper especially is needed for the renewable industry and that how they're going to be um, at the forefront of green technology and that mining is needed more than ever to save the, save the world. <laughs> so um, there's, 
you know, they really turn to anything that they think will help their case. But all the time, their main thing is they're going to be pay, providing well-paid jobs and creating wealth. And we say, you know, they don't count the damage they're going to do and they don't count the jobs that will be lost in farming and fishing and in tourism. At the end of the day, uh, it will be the people who will resist and it won't be the politicians and certainly uh, the Peter O'Donnell Socialist Republican Forum will not be wanting in supporting this campaign and because the aim of the forum is to promote the ideas of socialist republicanism as best expressed by Colney, Mallows and O'Donnell which hold that the people of Ireland should own and control the country and its resources politically, socially and economically in advancing the cause of undoing the conquest of Ireland and building a socialist republic. A few words from you, Sean, before we go. Um, could you just um, let us know what's actually happening now uh, you said that there were some uh, developments in the Line 5 campaign. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you so much for uh, having me today, Patricia and Fidelma, for the wonderful um, conversation we've been able to have. Um, yeah, our, our last update was uh, the Canadian federal government invoking uh, the 1977 Transit Pipeline Treaty in an effort to stall for Enbridge. Um, so as that process moves forward, we are you know, continuing our work uh, to shut down the pipeline. And if folks are interested in hearing more, we actually found out earlier this week, um, there's an event uh, coming up. Um, there is the uh, COP26 summit uh, coming up in Glasgow um, 31st of October through, I believe, the 12th of November, where the United Nations leaders will be meeting to discuss the climate crisis and their plans to respond. Oh. And one of our, um, you know, one of our leaders uh, in this fight, um, an indigenous woman from the Sioux St. Marie tribe here in Michigan named Kathy Brossimer, um, has been invited uh, to give a talk uh, at the summit, and she's giving a talk on Line 5 um, on Tuesday, the 9th of November at 4.30 in the afternoon, uh, local time in Glasgow, uh, at the Indigenous Peoples Pavilion uh, at the COP26 summit. So if any of your listeners are going to be in Glasgow then, um, please try to catch that talk from Kathy oh, Brossomer. It should be very absolutely, interesting. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and hopefully it will be recorded as well so that we can listen. Well, on that note, we will, we will end this interview and be rest assured, Dal Brady and... and Enbridge, that the people will always resist you. Thank you so much, Fidelma and Sean, and keep up the good work. Thank you. That was Patricia Campbell speaking with Sean McBrearty of the Oil and Water Don't Mix campaign for Michigan and the United States, and Fidelma O'Kane from the Save Our Spirits campaign. You have been listening to a broadcast from the Paddle Donald Socialist Republican Forum. Thank you.